fifth meeting in 2016 of the Public Petitions Committee. Can I remind all present to turn off any mobile phones and electronic devices in case they disrupt the recordings? Uh, our first item of uh, business this morning is a decision on whether to take item three on our agenda in consideration of a draft legacy paper in private and also whether to consider the draft legacy paper in private at future meetings. Do members agree? Agreed. Okay. <clears throat> that brings us to agenda item two, which is consideration of 11 continued petitions. The first one is PE1223 by Ron Beattie on school bus safety. Um, Mr Beattie is usually in the public gallery. I'm not sure whether he is here today, but um, he has had some ill health, so if, if he hasn't here, I'll really send our best wishes to him. It's a, an issue that he's pursued for some considerable time, so I hope that he's, uh, he's in good health in the near future. But we have Stuart Stevenson as MSP at the meeting. Stuart, you've been as dedicated to pursuing this as the petitioner, so I'll give you an opportunity to make some comments before we deliberate on the, the petition. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm sure uh, Ron Beatty will very much appreciate uh, your good wishes. Uh, he is making a, a good recovery, but uh, he's probably not been well enough to make the quite lengthy journey from uh, Gamery down to, to Edinburgh on this occasion. Um, the, the, the paper the committee has in front of uh, it uh, refers to the petitioner's latest uh, response, uh, and I think uh, the, the bottom line is at paragraph uh, uh, 17, uh, Transport Scotland are, are saying it's considering implications from the Glasgow pilot see whether any further action is required. And I would simply uh, ask the committee, uh, under the powers that it has to include this in its legacy paper, to consider that as an option because there is clearly an action that's still outstanding. And this is such an important subject, not simply for Ron Beattie and, uh, and my constituency, but across Scotland in ensuring that we have the best possible uh, outcomes uh, for uh, school transport and indeed transport of young people altogether. Convener. OK, thanks, uh, Stuart. Is there any of the colleagues have any comments to make? I think that's not an unreasonable request. I just think there is a bit of mileage. I don't mean that in a, as a pun, uh, but I still think there is a bit of uh, interest in this that we could continue to pursue, especially in relation to that suggestion. So I'm more than happy that if the members agree that we add this to our legacy paper and ask the, the next committee to continue to look into this. Agreed. John? So can I suggest that we do write to Transport Scotland, based on Mr Stevenson's comments, to find out when they expect the evaluation of the Glasgow pilot to be carried out, because this has effectively dragged on for a number of years. And Mr. Stevenson was, a, I think, you were still the Minister for Transport when we dealt with this initially, Mr. Stevenson. Uh, so it is about trying to get some conclusion to this. But I'd like to also put on record that it's useful to see the exchanges between the Department of Transport and the Scottish. Uh, Scottish Transport in relation to trying to get some clarification in the legislation uh, that can be applied uh, and transferred to ensure that we can actually take the appropriate action Mr Beatty has been calling for for over six years. Okay. So I think there is a general agreement that we, we take the petition forward uh, by adding it to our legacy paper and pursue the, the correspondence that John suggested. I think we have agreement on that. Okay. Thanks very much, Stuart, for your contribution. Our next petition is PE1408 by Andrea MacArthur on updating of pernicious anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency, understanding and treatment. Members have a view on this one. I don't... At least welcome progress, if I can put it that way. Yeah. I don't know that there's anything outstanding that we can take forward. It seems to have reached the, the end of the, the correspondence that we can be involved in. Members agree? Agreed. Okay. Um, Angus? It, it is noted in, in the recommendation that we could perhaps uh, alert the Scottish Government and the Scottish Haematology Society to the petitioner's latest response. Yeah. I think there's, there's some merit in that suggestion. Yeah. Um, well, we could still close it, but yeah. just get that clarification. Yeah. Okay. 
petition. Oh, sorry, Lynn. Yep, you want to make a Thanks comment. very much. Just before you close that petition, um, <coughs> I just obviously want to draw your attention to the links between the thyroid petition and all the issues around thyroid and the testing of B12, which is quite often not not actually done fully for thyroid patients, and it's quite a problem for thyroid patients too. Okay, well, we just maybe take that on board when we're considering that petition and see if we can pick up the point. John, do you think there's still something we need to do with it? I, I think there is. I, I, I don't know whether it's just me, but I, I seem to be reading a different interpretation into the petitioner's response to the issues that have been raised, because the petitioner certainly, uh, on page two of her response, indicates that there's still not sufficient guidance being issued in relation to the treatment. And I should have declared on interest my wife uh, receives regular injections uh, for this condition uh, and receives injections. And I know there's no, uh, as I've been reminded a number of occasions by ministers, there is no guidance in terms of how many injections a patient should be or how often a patient should get an injection for the vitamin B12 deficiency. But the reality is, is there still doesn't seem to be enough being done to treat the patient rather than treat what GPs and others may think is the solution to that. And I think the petitioner raises the, the issue about the effect that the infrequency or the frequency of current injections has on some of the patients uh, because of the time lag between getting an, an injection and receiving the next injection, that the quality of life diminishes dramatically. And I can uh, give personal experience of that, how that affects an individual because of the person I live with. So I think there is still some work to be done in this to try and ensure that we get some clarification from the government as to what is being issued. Sign has said they can't do anything because it's not in their agreement. But I think it, it is something that the Scottish Government should be aware of and maybe carry out some, ask them to carry out some investigations or some work into the overall impact uh, that patients suffer because of the lack of understanding, and I would say mainly by GPs and mainly in the testing method that's being applied uh, for patients who present uh, with vitamin B12 deficiency. And it would be useful to try and get some clarification because the petitioner does refer to the fact that the PCABs and IFABs uh, and the conditions that present uh, aren't always being uh, taken uh, on account, into account when prescribing uh, the course of treatment for the patient. So it's just to see if the, it would be worthwhile writing to the government to say, are they prepared to carry out some investigations that give us a clear indication of the benefits and the timescales that patients should be receiving uh, regular injections? Okay, on that basis then, I don't think we can close it because it sounds as though there is still some correspondence that we could be engaged in uh, with the government. It would mean just putting this into the legacy paper and, and waiting on the correspondence coming back. So on the basis of the, the questions that John wants to raise, are members happy that we do that and keep the petition open? by putting into the legacy paper. Okay. Our next petition is PE1463 by Lorraine Cleaver on effective thyroid and adrenal testing, diagnosis and treatment. Um, members have notes from the clerk and the submissions that were received, and there have been a number of them following on from the, the last discussion we had uh, at committee. Um, Elaine Smith, MSP, is with us again. Elaine, do you want to make some comments before we deliberate on it? Um, thanks very much, convener. I, I would certainly want to comment on the proposals that it's not to shut the petition. I would want to say that first of all, but to hopefully include it in the, the legacy paper, because I think what the committee's hard work over this session has shown um, is unearthed a whole lot of problems that some of us knew were there, but there's now a lot of evidence, I think, to, to show this, that when the petitioner started, first of all, um, with the round table discussion, it maybe wasn't quite clear about the, the problems involved with diagnosis and treatment of thyroid conditions. Um, so, first of all, I would want to thank the committee for all of those, the time and deliberations and the way the committee have looked into these issues and taken, you know, not just taken things at face value, but have actually dug deeper into some of these issues. Um, I also want to thank the, the petitioner, Lorraine Cleaver, for all her hard work and in sticking with this petition. It's quite a hard thing to do sometimes when you're 
you're not feeling particularly great yourself at times. So thanks to Lorraine for that. I think if you, we have a lot of submissions following the last meeting, but one of the most um, significant ones is probably the one you have from uh, Lynn Minot. And perhaps one of the most significant things that comes from that is that the trials that were mentioned are old trials. Um, they also, it, they also maybe don't tell you how much of the T4 and T3 were trialled on people. And actually, the, the whole, if you add up everybody who was trialled, I think uh, Lynn is saying it comes to less than their survey. So the bottom line for me, I think, after all of this, is that a lot more work needs to be done on this. I would certainly, um, if re-elected to Parliament, it would be something that personally I would wish to pursue much further. Um, but also, I think the bottom line is that we're not listening to patients that were taking a very clinical approach to this issue and there are so many people affected by it. There are so many different um, different ways that people are affected. They may not even know. They, they're put on T4, they're told that's you fine, your blood is fine and they may not understand that the fibromyalgia that they're suffering, that the hair loss that they're suffering, the, the continued tiredness that they're suffering, um, you know the symptoms I could go on with a host of things, the depression, um, the cholesterol, all of these things can be related back to the fact that the T4 actually isn't fully working for them. And what that does is it takes people out, if you just want to look at it in bold economic, bold economic terms, it takes people out of being economically active if they're not well. It also means that the NHS is frankly wasting a lot of money on tests, on treatments for things that could be sorted out if the person was given the right thyroid medicine. So I would ask, um, I, I think that that's what's in your conclusions, but I would ask that if it's in the legacy paper, that all your hard work is then passed on to the next petitions committee convener. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Elaine. Colleagues, have any views? I have to say I'm very sympathetic to the points that Elaine's made, and I think we do need to pursue this. I mean, the, the evidence session we had at our last meeting, although I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the minister came to be as comprehensive and uh, engaging with the issue as, as she possibly could be, but I think she needs to be careful of the officials that she brings with her, uh, because I think they raised more issues than, than they actually clarified, and I think on that, that basis we've got a lot of work still to do on this petition. Jackson, you want to do Yeah, yes, I, I would echo that point, convener. I, I, it's interesting reading the submissions since the evidence session, because they are actually among the strongest I've seen uh, submitted following an evidence session that we've taken. Um, and it, uh, they are from individuals, but who all express very much a similar, although a variable at the same time, point of view as to the way in which the evidence was presented to us. Um, I do think, unfortunately, the more we hear, the less certain we are about terribly much. Other than that, I think, as Elaine Smith said, there is a continuing issue here, which the committee will have to try and dig further into in the new parliament. And I do think it will be worthwhile um, to consider how that might be done uh, because we have actually now you know had several evidence sessions on the subject um, and yet I don't think we're satisfied but we'll need to be clear as to how we how we dig down to get to where we think we might be able to make a further positive contribution yeah and I think there is still work for a petitions committee to take forward on this so there's no danger that we're going to um, close this petition. I think uh, we put it in our legacy paper and we continue to ask the questions that are relevant uh, based on the submissions that we, we continue to have, the questions that keep arising and the information that Elaine's given us again this morning. So will we uh, take it forward in that way? Angus, you want to comment? Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, I think there's also, um, I mean, clearly I agree that uh, this, this should be continued. Um, but I think there's a lot of merit in the uh, suggestion from the petitioner that uh, the, the next committee may wish to take evidence from Dr John Midgley, um, who's already uh, clearly submitted evidence uh, on a number of occasions to, to this committee. Um, so I would like to see that included in the, the legacy paper as a, you know, clearly it's a decision for the next uh, PPC committee, but um, I think they should seriously consider it. Okay. I think everyone's agreed on that. Yep. So. We'll put the, the petition in their legacy paper and ask the next petitions committee to continue looking into it. Thanks again, Elaine, for, for that and for all those who've continued to contribute to the, the petition and keep updating us and asking the questions because we need to get to the bottom of this. So thanks very much to everyone. Okay. 
our next petition, PE 1568 by Catherine Hughes on funding, access and promotion of NHS centre for integrative care. Uh, Elaine, you staying with us for this one? Um, to be honest, convener, I was just going to listen to the committee, what you, you thought yourselves about the the evidence session and, and how you were intending to, to take it forward. I mean, I think it should be included in the legacy paper, but my, my own view is that quite clearly the, the, the patient centeredness, in fact, it, it says it on page three of your paper, um, and it's to do with Dr. Harpreet Coley's comments where he says, um, it was not an easy decision for board members to make because two elements of the college strategy were in dissonance. The evidence that we have about the effectiveness of intervention and the patient's centredness, I think that's the bottom line. The patients were very clear that this was a service that actually was very much helping and they wanted to keep when you, you look at the survey that was done. But um, the decision was made not on what the patients felt, what the patients wanted. And personally, I think in the long run, it's, a, it's the wrong decision. It's not just about um, homeopathic, it's far from it. It's the Centre for Integrative Care. And it's, it's much more than arguments about whether homeopathy works or it doesn't. Um, it, it, it's about patients and how they feel as well. And actually, I think it does, um, to my mind, it's coming down to short-term savings, but it will cost a lot in the long term. John. Agree with Wayne Smith in terms of it's, a, it's an issue I would like to see put in our legacy paper because there are, are a number of decisions still to be made by Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, but particularly in terms of Lanarkshire Health Board's decision and the way they made the decision has come under some scrutiny. Uh, and while we were assured that patients would continue to receive the, a level of care uh, commensurate with their illness, uh, there is, a, I believe, a letter in today's uh, Herald which raises the issue about someone who had been uh, initially tried to be referred to CIC and uh, taking eight months to then be referred on to a consultant to be dealt with. So the, clearly there are issues about, if we are talking about patient-centred care, then if the patients feel that they benefit from the going to CIC, then given that the Lanarkshire Health Board have taken a decision to withdraw supported funding for any future patients, then it raises questions about the quality of care patients receive and their confidence in the uh, treatment they receive. And I think there's some, some interesting submissions, that, like the last petition, there's been some interesting follow-up submissions made and some analysis, uh, one of the submissions that goes into the cost benefits of actually the particular homeopathic treatments uh, and gives a startling indication of the savings that could be that are being made, not could be made, but are being made in terms of uh, the NHS. So I think there is more work can be done on this, and I, I certainly I would be keen to pass on some of the submissions we've received to the Scottish Government and to NHS Scotland to ask them their views on the fact that, and to try and disprove some of the evidence we've received for today's meeting, uh, and give us clear indications. If we are continue to rely on health boards funding CIC, then the danger is that it could always be pulled at any time when health boards decide no longer to send patients to that centre. So it's about trying to preserve a centre that is delivering for the whole of Scotland, but we're relying on one health board effectively, maybe potentially picking up the cost for that. And clearly Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board may at some point make a decision to actually withdraw those services for patients who feel they would benefit from that treatment. And Zala, then Jackson. Yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Colley made a very gallant uh, case uh, for why the decision was made. However, he, one thing I failed to quite grasp was the fact that they all agreed that the patients were actually happy with the service they were receiving. To me, that overturns any other type of discussion or agreement because they're there to provide a service. And if the people are happy with the service they're receiving, why are we closing it and why are we not letting people use it? I just couldn't fathom that bit out, that why are we ignoring the patients who are actually using the service and are, in fact, happy with the service. The very few patients today are happy with the service they receive, but here is a clear indication of people are happy with the service 
And despite that fact, we choose to ignore that fact, and I think that's wrong. Jackson. I think it was another slightly unsatisfactory evidence session. Um, and it was difficult not to arrive at the conclusion, as Hansala Malik has said, that there were cost factors that were motivating it. Underpinning that, bluntly, uh, and although nobody will actually use the language as such, um, I, I'm very much left with the impression that for some people you might as well be banging voodoo drums. Uh, that is their underlying belief. So they set aside, because it is inconvenient, the patient response, which apparently is of a much higher level of satisfaction than in many other areas of traditional health care. The difficulty in all of this, I think, is that at some point, uh, unless the Scottish Government is going to take a national view as to what role it believes uh, complementary medicine, in its broadest sense, plays within the NHS, then the health boards which are charged with making the decision look to me to be inexorably moving towards a position where this service will not be provided. So I think in carrying it forward in the legacy paper, and we do want to see what the outcome of the uh, current review is, but I do think that after that it may very well be that this is a subject in its holistic sense that we should be referring to the Health and Sport Committee of the new Parliament as one that they may want to consider uh, as worthy of a more serious uh, look in the context of a broader health care policy, uh, because I don't know how much further we'll be able to take the issue at that point. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think there is a large body of work that a, a health committee could look at, but I think this committee has had questions raised um, because of the evidence that we've heard. Um, there's nothing we can do about it in the short term left available to us, but I think it has to be in our legacy paper so that it remains on the, the yeah. open to the, the next petitions committee to look at it. And in putting it into the legacy paper, I think we also have to suggest that they might consider an early course bringing uh, the next cabinet secretary for health in front of them to, to ask some of these pertinent questions because um, we just didn't get a satisfactory uh, outcome from our deliberations at the last meeting. It raised more questions than answers. Um, and I think there is a, a real amount of work that the, the petitions committee still has to do, um, as well as indicating this is an issue that I think the health committee needs to, to be mindful of as well and start to consider it. Because I think there are huge implications around this. John? Just, uh, I can be corrected if I'm wrong in this assumption, but my understanding is CIC was also supposed to become the National Pain Clinic uh, for treatment. Uh, so it, it does, does raise other issues. It's not just about alternative treatments or, or you know, homeopathic treatments. It's about trying to build a centre of excellence that can uh, deal with patients from throughout Scotland. Because we, we've heard before that in terms of uh, pain treatment, some patients were being sent south of the border. Uh, to Bath uh, for uh, treatment uh, and the idea uh, was to have a centre in Scotland and CIC is being uh, put forward as the possible centre for that. So it's just the difficulty, the overall funding difficulty, if we don't get NHS Scotland to take a national view on CIC, then we could end up with other services being impacted upon and other vital services that people are looking for in relation to pain control and other treatments. Uh, so it would be useful if we could get the Scottish Government to give a clear indication of what funding uh, they're intending to put into CIC in the future so that we don't, as I said earlier, rely on health boards making arbitrary decisions about withdrawing funding for treatment which may impact on other delivery methods that are being no, going to potentially be carried through CIC. I was only going to say, actually, in response to John Wilson, the one thing I did think that we gleaned from the evidence session was that the uh, National Pain Relief Centre was not contingent on the uh, the, uh, the Centre for Integrative Care. I mean, it, it did seem to me that there was a, a clear distinction in the minds of the witnesses between the two. Uh, but nonetheless, I think obviously the fact that they cohabit a space uh, raises questions in terms of how all that would function. 
Convener, while I agree with Jackson Carlow that the, the witnesses told us on the day that it would, wouldn't be contingent on it, I would like to see that in black and white from the Scottish Government to say that it wouldn't be contingent and the funding would be made available from a national funding source rather than relying once again on individual NHS boards uh, contributing to the delivery of that service because it is about ensuring the, those services are maintained in a way that is satisfactory for the patients. Uh, and not relying on individual health boards withdrawing funding at a later stage. Yeah, that's a, a very valid point. If you're going to have only one centre in the whole of Scotland, which is to serve the whole of Scotland, you can't then have one uh, local health board uh, footing the, the bill for that and hoping that other health boards will, will make a contribution that has to be funded properly. Um, I think we also need to get clarification on just exactly this connection between the pain centre and the integrative care centre. I'm, my understanding is one's going to be at Gap Naval and the other uh, at one of the other facilities, so they might not be the same facility, so we need to get clarification around that and where the funding is going to come for these um, these services. Elaine, yeah. Thanks. On that point, Convener, I think there was a bit of worry too that the, the, the National Pain Centre might be instead of the Centre for Integrative Care, so that's another issue. Yeah. Okay, so we need to get clarification of exa exactly where that is, and that requires us to keep the petition open and uh, and pursue it. As I said, there have been a number of suggestions this morning about communications that we need to make uh, and uh, about what to suggest to the uh, the petitions committee in the next session in our legacy paper, and we'll include all of them uh, in the legacy paper. Okay. Our next two petitions will be taken together. Again, sorry, thanks, Elaine, for your contribution on that. Uh, our next two petitions will be taken together. They are PE1480 by Amanda Copel on behalf of the Frank Copel's Alzheimer's Awareness Campaign on Alzheimer's and Dementia Awareness, and PE1533 by Jeff Adamson on behalf of Scotland Against the Care Tax on Abolition and Non-Residential Social Care Charges for Older and Disabled People. Um, again, we've had some correspondence on this, and members have the briefing from the clerk on it. Again, I think this is one that's going to continue to require our attention, so we can take on board all of the points made by the petitioners and their submissions and pass this to the, the, the next committee. Is that okay? Our next petition, PE1495 by Rab Wilson on behalf of Accountability Scotland on the use of gagging clauses in agreements with NHS staff in Scotland. Members have any views on what we do with this one? Is there anything we can usefully do to take it forward? I see people shaking their heads, so I, I just don't think there's anything else that, that we can do to address this one. Will we close it on I think that point? Uh, next petition is PE1571 by John Beatty on food bank funding. Um, I think the, the response is, is very clear, but this is, a, again, an ongoing issue. We could, are the Welfare Committee aware of this one? I mean, they, they will be looking at these issues on, on an ongoing basis. Uh, we could just pass it on to them and, and ask them to look at it. John, have you got a... I agree, convener, pass it on to the Welfare Committee and ask them to include it in their legacy paper, mm -hmm. because it's, I think it's an issue that's going to continue, particularly uh, when we're getting other uh, powers transferred to the Scottish Government, that it would be useful if the Welfare Committee, uh, if they're continuing after the next session, uh, into the next session, then if we pass it on uh, for their consideration. Okay. Um, we need to check to see whether the Welfare Committee has drawn up its legacy paper. It may be yep. too late to include it. If that's right. the case, we could keep a hold of it in our legacy paper with the suggestion that it goes to the Welfare Committee at some point in the next session. Yeah? Okay. Okay, our next petition, PE1592 by Shaheen McQuaid on Group B Strep Information and Testing. Um, I'm still not satisfied that we've had an outcome that addresses the petition. The, the reason why this petition came back was because an earlier petition was closed on the basis that we were going to get an outcome. And this petition is on the basis that we still await that outcome. I would like to suggest that we put this into our legacy paper so that it doesn't drop off the agenda again. Members agreed with that? 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, next petition, PE 1593, by Paul Quigley, on behalf of Fans Against Criminalisation, on a full review of the offensive behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Scotland Act. We received responses back from those we contacted, and we've also had a submission um, from Fans Against Criminalisation, uh, on whose behalf Paul Quigley brought the petition. Um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done in relation to looking into this, even as late as this morning. Um, there's been um, some uh, information supplied in the national newspaper, and it includes uh, a letter signed by a host of organisations that continue to have concerns over this, individuals and organisations, across a whole swathe of Scottish society. So I think it would be remiss of us to say that there isn't some work still to be done in respect to this. And on a personal level... Um, I've been, I was very disappointed with the response that was received from the Minister uh, in respect of one particular issue. Um, I, I, as sort of personal to me, and I have to raise it because it, it does reflect on something that he maintains in his letter. When he made a statement to the, the Parliament about the review, he made a claim that one aspect of it in terms of um, rehabilitation of offenders, uh, which he claimed... Uh, in his statement, had the support of the fans groups who were opposed to the legislation. Um, his wording was very careful, but he continues when asked about this claim and this connection that, that he makes between what he um, was putting forward and his claim that Fans Against Criminalisation endorsed that proposal. His wording is very, you know, I'm not saying misleading, but he's, he's carefully chosen in order to allow him to make that claim. But in the debate that followed this, the statement, I asked a very specific question in relation to that. And in response to my question, the minister went away from his carefully crafted words and made a very clear statement that fans against criminalisation fully endorsed his, his position. When people challenge that assertion, he refers to his, the comments he made in his statement, but he, he ignores the comments that he made to me. And I just find that unacceptable. The, the people are challenging him on the basis of what he said in the chamber, and, and he continues to maintain that he didn't say something that he said. And I just find that totally unacceptable on a personal level. Um, and I, I just want to make that absolutely clear. But based on all of the information we've had, Further information submitted this morning. The views of, as I said, a whole host of people in, in wider society, we, ha we have to pass this on to the next petitions committee to ask them to continue to look at it, in my view. Jackson? Um, I'm just going to posit a contrary view, just for discussion's sake. Um, I'm opposed to this act. Uh, my party is committed to its abolition. Um, but the petition asks us to urge the Scottish Government to hold a full and comprehensive review and we have a letter from the Minister which says that the Scottish Government will not be undertaking a review. Um, and I'm not actually sure on that basis, given such a definitive response from the Government, whether this rests still with us as a petitions committee or whether it enters into the wider political domain of debate. And, and that's where I'm slightly unsure as to whether maintaining the petition is the correct thing to do in those circumstances, convener, but I, I'm, I'm open to persuasion. So then at least or to one other colleagues' views. <clears throat> and at least one of the issues that, that the Minister responded, I would like to get clarification, but the, the submission from Fans Against Criminalisation challenges a lot of what has been said by Police Scotland and the Minister, and I think we, we would be entitled to go back and ask them for, for clarification on those point, points. And then, you know, that's how this committee would look at an issue, if, if new issues are raised or if uh, points made by um, uh, those who we contact in their, their responses uh, in that correspondence um, raise other questions. And I think the, the, the committee has gone back and asked for clarification around those points. So if you take all of the items that Fans Against Criminalisation highlighted in respect of uh, filming of fans, um, the, the treatment of fans, various other aspects of, of the issue, more, more points have been raised and it would be normal practice for us to continue a petition in order to, to pursue those, those questions. I think it's always worth, and it's, it may be unfair to single out one individual, I won't name the individual, 
But one of the people who signed the letter asking for a review in the, the newspaper this morning is one of the academics who took part in the study, which has now been claimed to be the review in which the, the issue has been upheld. So if even people who participated in looking at the issue think that there has to be a review, I think it would be remiss of us not to continue to ask that question. Hans Allah, then, John. Uh, Chair, um, I think that uh, it's not unreasonable for the petition to ask for the review that they have because there has been a lot of uh, misunderstanding of the whole bill. There's been a lot of... Um, I've met a lot of constituents who have said to me that the bill is not designed to have the fact that it's supposed to have had... supposed to have designed for and there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of hardship being suffered by people and I think the, on the basis of the fact that people are suffering hardship that in itself says to me that we really need to have a look at this again and to be to be really frank convener I don't want to go into the nitty-gritty of who said what to whom I think what's more important for my constituents is are they going to be treated fairly or not and the perception there is that they're not and that needs to be addressed and I think it's absolutely essential that we carry this forward in a legacy so that we continue to uh, pursue this issue if any citizens of Scotland feels that they are being um, treated unfairly we need to address that that's the bottom line I would just put it to you okay, I'll come to you in a second I would just put it to the committee that We've debated a number of petitions this morning where there are still outstanding questions and we've had clear answers from government bodies, the government of, uh, ministers themselves who have said no to uh, a particular request, but we've continued to take an interest in it because questions have continued to arise. And I would suggest, without prejudging what the, the next committee would do, that we should at least ensure that they have a chance to look at this and that the responses to the questions that have been raised in the submissions be allowed to come back to the committee before they decide to either pass it on to someone else or close the petition. John? Oh, out. sorry, Kenny, first. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh. Sorry. <clears throat> I mean, I, I think there's a lot of logic in what Jackson says. Equally, I'm relaxed. It does, though, seem to me that we've come to the end of the road to some extent in what we can do. The Minister is quite clear there is no going to be any review by the government. Equally, notwithstanding what you've said, convener, the minister denies that, and without going back and forward, as others have said, who said what. Equally, it does clearly still be an, uh, still is an issue that's running. It's going to be something that people have chosen to make an election issue, and we will see what the outcome is come May. And it might then be that the committee will seek to raise it, or it might be that it will not. Uh, so I would be relaxed about it being in the legacy paper, but I would be very reluctant to see what any further inquiries work that we can take, because I don't think there's anyone that we can go to that's not going to say, I told you before, we're not reviewing it again, and equally, I stand by what I said in Parliament or whatever. But continuing it in the legacy paper is perfectly acceptable to me. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I say that... The I'm opposed to this legislation and the, the way the legislation has been carried out. And I know Mr. McCaskill may have other views on this, but the reality for me is I think it should be in the legacy paper. But uh, convener, I would go slightly further uh, than saying it just should be in the legacy paper because clearly, as you've indicated uh, from the responses we've received this morning, but also from the petitioner's submission, uh, where he actually cites one of the authors of the uh, review document, uh, it's quite clear that the uh, clearly issues still arising about the, the way this review has been used by the government. And while the government says that they're not prepared to carry out any further work on it, the committees of this parliament have a duty and a responsibility and a right to actually carry uh, their own scrutiny of legislation and how legislation has been carried out. It, if Jackson Carlow would let me finish, uh, the, this committee previously undertook an inquiry into child sexual exploitation, an issue which could have been passed on to another committee of this parliament, but this, the Public Petitions Committee, uh, under the convenership of David Stewart, decided to take forward its own inquiry and make recommendations to the Scottish Government. 
And I would say that this issue may actually be an issue that, that I would, if we include it in the legacy paper to the next committee, suggest to them that they, if no other committee or the government are not prepared to carry out a review, then this committee should be advised or recommended uh, that they should, may want to carry out a review of this legislation uh, as a committee and basically do the same as what they did with petition uh, 1393 and carry out is, and bring in the witnesses uh, and others uh, to form a basis of recommendations to the Scottish Government because, as has been said, the, it's not up to the Government, it's up to the, this Parliament has got to reinstitute the right to make the Government accountable for the legislation that it puts through and how that legislation is actually being delivered and how it's seen to be delivered in society. So I think there is a, something stronger that we can actually say, and that would be to make the recommendation uh, that we, it's a le part, forms part of our legacy paper, but also with the view that we could potentially carry out uh, the committee to carry out its own inquiry into this issue so we can once and for all get some resolution to the issues that have been raised and a proper scrutiny of legislation that has seemed to be detrimental to a number of people in society. The members happy that we at least leave it in the legacy paper and let the next committee have a look at it. I think we've got an agreement, even if it's not entirely enthusiastic. <laughs> we'll, we'll put it into the legacy paper. Okay, thanks. And our final petition today, PE1594 by Richard Burton on behalf of Accountability Scotland on specification of lying as an example of public maladministration. Members think we need to do anything else with this? No. Just close it. No, no other value in it at all. Okay, so we close. Sorry, Angus. The basis that line is already uh, considered to fall within the definition of a maladministration uh, by the SPSO and the Scottish Government is not minded to create a statutory definition of maladministration um, because this may unduly restrict the SPSO's role and function. I think that's worth having on the record. Thank you. Thanks very much for putting that there. Okay, so we can close uh, agenda item two and uh, close the meeting to the public. You have all deserted us anyway. Um, and we go into private session in order to discuss our legacy paper. Thanks very much.